Henry Dimbleby is co-founder of Leon Restaurants and the Sustainable Restaurant Association. In 2021, he published uh, the Government Commission National Food Strategy for England, quickly shelved by the Boris administration for being too controversial. In 2023, he co-authored this book, Ravenous, uh, the Sunday Times best-selling manifesto on how to change the food system, the nation's health, and protect the planet. If you haven't read it, I really would recommend it. It's a must-read for anyone in our sector especially. So, what should we be doing now? How does the industry get a foothold in the debate? And it's a debate that we do need to get a foothold in. And how does it be part of the conversation around people, food, and planet? To share his thoughts, including some very robust views, I'm told, you've been warned. Please welcome Henry Dimbleby. Thank you very much. That's me, right. Um, the, a few weeks before we launched Leon, uh, I went to see my sister in Glasgow to go and watch a White Stripes gig to try and kind of relieve the pressure. John and I had been uh, planning everything in minute detail. We were just waiting for the launch day. And um, we got to the Glasgow Arena, massive, I think 3,000 uh, strong auditorium. And everyone before uh, they, Jack and Meg were coming on stage was kind of positioning themselves so kind of moving a foot here, make sure you're not standing behind the tall man, uh, make sure you've got the best view of the... Uh, is it possible to turn quite a lot of feedback on my mic? Is it possible to turn it down a bit? That's... There you go, OK. Still quite a lot. Should I take, should I take this off or should I turn this off? Henry, yeah? Stay away from that speaker. That speaker there? OK. I'll stay away from that speaker. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we were, we, were, um, we were standing there, uh, and Jack White came on, walked on from the side, and took one great strum of his guitar. And within uh, seconds, my sister was 20 metres over that direction. Uh, I had been kind of pushed in the other direction. I'd had a can of beer thrown at my head. All chaos and all the planning had fallen apart. This is very much what the first day uh, of Leon felt like <laughs> when we opened it. And actually, uh, you'll be better, you're, you're probably better operators than, than I might take off, this, uh, take off this mic and speak into this one, hold on. Maybe it's the two mics that are causing the problem. Sorry. Just otherwise we'll be Is that better? You could turn this mic on now. Um, so um, uh, that's what the first day of Leon went. It was actually felt pretty much like what Leon felt like every day. I'm sure you were better at running restaurants uh, than we were. But in that context, when we were faced with ideas such as sustainability, the idea of trying to fix that with everything else that was going on was a kind of living hell. And we didn't have, at that point, COVID, Ukraine, cost of living. And so what I kind of talked to Peter about was it might make sense just to talk today about, um, very simply, why everything is as fucked up as it is. <laughs> because actually it's not as obvious as you might think. And what can hospitality do? Because I think that uh, you do have, we do have, a primary purpose to entertain to please our customers, to look after our teams. And therefore, what we do on sustainability, we should really focus on where we can be most effective. Uh, before I kind of uh, go into that, just to talk through my, my walk into sustainability, it was a slightly random walk. I kind of came into campaigning by mistake. When we opened Leon, it was a selfish business. Everyone... Uh, basically, our, our, what we wanted to do was have fast food that tasted good and did you good. It was nothing about environmental stuff at all. That had nothing to do with it. Because of the way we spoke, because of the images that we used, people assumed we were doing all sorts of things that we weren't doing. So, for example, everyone assumed we were organic, which we weren't. We had to train our staff 
if people asked, is it organic, to say no, because obviously if there's a big queue there, the easy thing is to say yes. And that kind of got us interested. And then the more that we saw of the supply chain, the more interested we got in that area. And that was the point at which Mark Sainsbury approached me and said, I'm trying to run Morrow. It's a living hell just hiring the right people and making money. And now I've got to do all the sustainability thing. I'm thinking of setting up the Sustainable Restaurant Association. We will help individual restaurants like yours and mine solve that problem. We'll do the thinking for them. And so we became founding members, and I was a founding director of the Sustainable Restaurant Association. That led to being asked, kind of Leon, that led to being asked by government to do some work on a school food plan, which was to set out how we could improve school food in England. It led to, among other things, universal free school meals for infants, cooking on the curriculum up to the age of 14 as compulsory, which is the law but isn't happening. And there's a, we can talk about that story later about how passing laws isn't always sufficient to get things to happen. Um, off the back of that, I was asked to do the National Food Strategy, which was uh, set up, um, which is trying to say for the nation, how do we create a food system that delivers enough food but does so without destroying our health and the environment. Along the way, I founded London Union, which ran for a time Street Feast, which were absolutely brilliant, and that business very sadly failed. Um, it's one of the saddest things in my life that you could not go to Dinorama, because when it was pumping with 10 bars and eight street food operators serving Michelin-style quality food, it was really just kind of the best place to eat in the world, I thought. Uh, and also set up a charity, Chefs and Schools, which came out of the school food plan, and then turned the food strategy into ravenous. And I'm now... Uh, I've set up a, an investment company, Bramble, to invest in businesses in the food system that either make the food system healthier, more sustainable, or improve food security. So why are we in the mess we are? When we wrote the food strategy, we decided to, to tell the story kind of uh, going back a bit further than most, most people do. And this is important because the reason that the food system is such a mess is because we solved a huge problem in the past. So, uh, in 1945, just after the war, there were 2.8 billion people on the planet. That was more than uh, there had ever been before. Uh, but scientists projected that that number would grow over the next 50 years to 8 billion due to improvements in medicine, improvements in sanitation. And up until that point, these three lines, the, the green line shows the amount of land we farm globally. The black line shows the population. The red line shows the number of calories produced. And basically, in the whole of humanity, if you trace this back to 10,000 BC, the beginning of the Holocene, which was the period of stable climate that allowed us to farm, you would see, as the human population increased, we dug up more land to feed ourselves. And the problem was that that green line, we were running out of land. So in 1945, if you projected the population growth to grow to 8 billion, we wouldn't have enough land to feed people. And if you read the newspapers at the time, they are full of the kind of late 40s, early 50s. They're full of uh, concern about the next, 10, the next five decades being decades of hunger, being decades of wars, of resource shortage, uh, being decades where the human population was capped uh, and some people survived and other people didn't, other people starved. And what these scientists hadn't reckoned on was a man called Norman Borlaug. If I talk to farmers, everyone knows who Norman Borlaug is. When you talk to almost anyone else, no one knows who Norman Borlaug is. He's probably the most important man of the last hundred or so years who no one knows. In the book, we talk about if there's been a biopic of his life, he would have been played by Jimmy Stewart. He was an American, square-jawed, good American teeth. But there wasn't a biopic of his life because he saved, he stopped disaster happening. He did this. He was a botanist. He'd grown up in Idaho uh, during the Great Depression. He'd seen hunger close up. He had set upon a mission to, uh, to make people be able to eat more, better, nutritious food. That was his mission in life. And he was sent by the Rockefeller Foundation to... Mexico towards the end of the Second World War. He arrived and he wrote to his wife that what he had seen had clubbed his mind. He said the, the quality of the soil, the lives of these people uh, are, are, are terrible. They're just scraping by. And he had an idea that if he could combine 
uh, a high-yielding wheat with a short-stemmed wheat he'd heard about in Japan, because when you had these high-yielding wheats in those days, the stems were very long and thin, and you could get a high-yielding wheat, but if it blew, wind blew, it got knocked over, so you'd use a crop. But he'd heard about this short-stemmed wheat in Japan. He thought, if I can cross those wheats, then maybe I can create something that will alleviate the hunger in Mexico. And he spent uh, uh, several years scuttling between two research bases, one in the, uh, by the sea, one in the mountains, so he had two harvests, literally crossing thousands and thousands of strains of wheat by hand, cutting off the stamen, tapping them over the uh, flowers of the other plants, seal paper clipping over little paper hoods to make sure they escaped, and just by trial and error trying to get the genes to mutate. And he would admit, by luck, but also by stubbornness, he succeeded. And he created this, what, what you now know as wheat. If you walk past a wheat field now, that is Borlaug's wheat. Uh, and when combined with nitrogen fertilizer and modern forms of irrigation, it uh, hugely increased the, uh, the yields of wheats in Mexico. By 1960, when he left, Mexico was self-sufficient in wheat, having imported over half its wheat when he arrived. And that experiment was repeated for rice and for maize uh, across the world. And what ironically is known as the Green Revolution came to pass. We now uh, produce almost twice as many calories per, per person on the planet as we did in 1945 from slightly less land because when the Soviet Union fell out of... Uh, Collapse. A lot of collective farms on marginal land fell out of production. And that is for 8 billion people rather than 2.8 billion people. It is an astonishing success story. To give you a, uh, to give you a sense of, um, of the kind of scale of this success, if the Harbour-Bosch process, the, the method of fixing nitrogen, which interestingly was in the Treaty of Versailles, we made the Germans give it to the rest of the world because it was so important in the Treaty of Versailles. If that didn't exist, if that nitrogen fertiliser was switched off overnight, somewhere between 30% to 50% of the people on the planet would not be able to have enough food to eat. So this is our, this success story underpins our whole food system. But as so often happens when you solve a problem, you can also create other unintended problems. And what is hard to exaggerate is the extent to which our food system has come to dominate the environment. One way of looking at this is to look at the weight of, of animals. And this is 10,000 BC. This is the period of the Holocene, a period of stable climate, just beginning farming, uh, just being, becoming possible for the 2.5 million people who lived on the planet at that time, represented by that little blue dot, dwarfed by the number of wild animals, vertebrates, uh, land-dwelling vertebrates and birds in this case. If you fast forward to today, the picture to the same scale has changed slightly. So... You can see those wild animals have significantly diminished, initially due to our enthusiastic hunting of megafauna, but that, that dim, diminution has continued. In the UK, for example, since 1970, our wheat yields have doubled and the population of wild birds in this country has halved. So we continue to erode uh, wildlife. The horses, cats and dogs weigh at any one time almost as much as all of the wild animals. And... The animals that we rear to eat or to eat their milk uh, at any one time weigh twice as much as all of the people and 20 times as much as all of the wild animals. Food has pushed everything, out of, uh, everything else out of the ecosystem. And this matters because the way the food system is today, it is actually threatening uh, the way that we produce food in the future. The way we eat is imperiling the way we eat. This is the most frightening chart that we saw um, when we were doing the food strategy. This shows the projected wheat yields in the north and then rice and maize in the equatorial zones in the south. And in 2.5 degree climate scenario, actually in the north, wheat yields are expected to rise. It likes carbon dioxide, it likes warm weather, it likes rain. Uh, and in the south and the equatorial zones, rice and maize yields are, are, are going to collapse. Um, and this looks like, this, this, you know, when you look at this, conjures up the same threats that those scientists back in 1945 had. This looks to me like mass migration. It looks like warfare of resources. The food system we have is kind of central. It's this weird 
thing about COP. COP in Glasgow was meant to be the biodiversity COP, and food wasn't anywhere in it. Uh, but food is completely central to this debate. Food, the food system is by far the biggest cause of biodiversity collapse. It's the biggest cause of deforestation. It's the biggest cause of, oil of soil degradation, of freshwater shortage, of freshwater stress, the collapse of life in the oceans. And as someone was mentioning earlier, after energy, it's the biggest contributor to climate change, about 20 to 30 percent of global emissions. And actually, uh, in the agriculture area, it's the only form of, of global greenhouse gas emissions that isn't decreasing, it's staying over time. And it's also destroying our health. So this is years lost to uh, n avoidable, non-communicable disease. Uh, the, the pink circles are things that are caused by diet. It's m massively outstripped uh, smoking now as a cause of early death. By 2035, we estimate that type 2 diabetes is going to cost the NHS more than all cancers do to treat today. Chris Whitty, during lockdown, when he was quite busy, was online in his spare time giving lectures about the disaster that's facing the NHS because of diet. Uh, and now the Treasury, and it'll be interesting to see if they mention this tomorrow, I think they might, might, might mention this tomorrow, they think that the 2.8 million people who are out of work at the moment, more than have ever been out of work before with long-term sickness, are there because of four conditions. Type 2 diabetes, musculoskeletal problems, hypertension, and mental health, three of which are caused by, directly by diet and one of which is exacerbated by it. So if you project this forward without doing anything, we end up both uh, a sick and impoverished country. The NHS sucks in the money from the rest of the economy because we can't afford to let the NHS go down, we become less productive, tax takes go down, results, disaster. And actually, you know, if you look at, you know, uh, Mark was talking about the government response, the government actually, at the report I uh, produced, they've actually been very good on the environmental stuff. There's a lot of progress on the environmental stuff. They've gone backwards on health. So there were restrictions that they were bringing in on health, which they're no longer doing. But actually, I think that over the next 10, 15 years, it's just going to be so obvious the harm that food is doing to our health that governments are going to be forced to act. And I'll talk a little bit at the end about what that means for hospitality. So uh, when, when, I get, when people get to this bit in the book, I often get texts saying, God, your book's depressing. Um, but it does get, but part three is a bit more upbeat. But it is quite frightening. But there are solutions here. We should draw on the fact that we solved the solutions of the past, and more like we can solve the solutions today. And one of the great things about being doing a government review is that you can, and particularly, particularly during COVID, you can get on a Zoom, or actually in government it's Teams, uh, at any point, at any time, the greatest minds on the planet to talk about what the solutions are. And that was one of the most, if, if you ever get asked to do a government review, I was, it's a living hell and everyone on Twitter hates you, but you do get, if you can switch that off and you're good on the mute button, uh, then you do get this opportunity just to meet incredible people who have thought very deeply in all of these areas. And the first thing we ask them is, how do you even begin to solve a problem like this? And um, they all said, you have to use systems thinking, like literally everyone. And then you go, great, um, like how do you do that? And interestingly, there was, a, there was a really genuine divide between really smart people. So some people showed us a thing called the foresight obesity map, which is an incredibly complicated tangle of interconnections that purport to show all of the various causes that lead to obesity. It looks like if you have a few moments this afternoon and you haven't done it already, Google spiders on drugs, and there's a, there's a, there's a, a Washington Post quiz. They, there are literally a whole, there's a whole group of scientists who give spiders recreational drugs. That's their living, and then watch what they do. And if you go onto the Washington Post, you can look at the webs they make, and you have to guess which drug the spider was on <laughs> when they made the webs. People running nightclubs are probably particularly good at this quiz. But actually, it's, it's, it's quite easy. The one, on, the one on marijuana kind of starts and then gives up. Uh, the one on LSD does these amazing fractal patterns. And uh, the one on speed produces something that looks like the foresight obesity map, a kind of massive tangle of uh, frenzied webs. And that's kind of fine for saying it's complicated, but it's not very useful when you actually want to act. The other thing that people showed us was a chart 
that shows how responsibility for food is spread across government like a kind of thin layer of jam on toast. Every government department has a different responsibility for food. And that is a problem. And I know that you know, during COVID, many of us who were trying to get the government to respond to help hospitality, to, 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 to keep supply chains moving, we saw that, that, uh, that tension. And actually, uh, I think in the end, the government did a very good job of smashing that all together. And we had this 8.30 call, frith with all the food businesses on it and all the government departments. But it is a problem, but it's not the root cause of the problem. The person who kind of directed us to the right way of thinking were a group of people, but it was led by Ian Boyd, who was the chief scientific officer at DEFRA at the time. He was a biologist. He studies the movement of energy through systems, through biological systems. And he pointed out that uh, the, the, the science of system dynamics, which actually was invented at MIT in, with business applications, but looks at how systems fail and why they fail had actually been adopted it's one of the few sciences that had been adopted throughout biology and that actually what we had to look at were the feedback loops that were going wrong what were the dominant feedback loops that were going wrong and if you could fix those maybe you could try and write the system and the good news is that in the food system the dominant feedback loops are actually quite obvious when you think of it in that framing uh, the first problem is what Part of the economist Parthadas Gupta called in his Economics of Biodiversity the invisibility of nature. So he points out that uh, nature is quite hard to count. And I, I had a lot of sympathy person who said it's, we had, there's a danger in fixing this that we focus on what we can measure rather than what we should measure. Uh, nature mm. is silent often. It's invisible. It's underground. It's underwater. It's high up in the air. It moves around, it doesn't sit around waiting to be measured. But Dasgupta says it's worse than that. We don't even try and measure it. And if you look at the ways in which we measure human success, it's completely, almost completely invisible. You can't count it in your wallet. It's not in the PL, the balance sheet of companies, although some are just beginning to introduce it. And it's not in the way we measure GDP. And in fact, it's worse than that. He estimates that globally, Governments subsidise the destruction of nature to the tune of about $500 billion a year, creating about 4 to $6 trillion of damage through subsidies mainly to industrial farming, fossil fuel companies, and fishing companies. And so actually, that's good news, because if you're paying people to destroy something, uh, then if you stop paying them and start valuing it, it should be possible to fix that. If you change the incentives in the system, you should be possible to fix that. The other feedback loop I think is going to be harder to fix, and I think it may be in the end fixed by drugs. So that is what we call the junk food cycle, which is that our evolved appetite makes us seek out food. We evolved a calorie-scarce environment, which is highly fatty, sugary, and salty. When we eat that food, it gives us disproportionate pleasure. And when that food is low in water, highly calorie-dense, soft, and heart and low and insoluble fiber, it fills us up much less quickly. And so uh, we eat more of that food. Food companies, not because they're evil uh, people who want to kill our children, but simply because that's where they spotted the money was, uh, have spent more and more of their money, more and more of their research and development, developing those foods. We've eaten more, they've spent more, we've eaten more, they spent more, and we've got sick. It isn't complicated. 85% of the products of the large processed food companies now are deemed by the WHO to be, um, to be too unhealthy to market to children. Uh, you can buy 28 to 29 kinds of Kit Kat in this country. You know, why? Because they're easy to sell. And in fact, the 29th was launched uh, last year. And this is what the junk food cycle looks like. This is at child's eye level on your supermarket shelf, two huge multinational companies trying to tell, uh, to sell your children stuff that they should not be eating for breakfast. Uh, in the words of, has anyone been following Eddie Abu on uh, Instagram? Because if you haven't, he's very, very funny. He's an old uh, muscle weightlifter uh, trying to get us all to, uh, to eat better food and to eat food cooked from scratch. And he wanders around supermarkets, kind of showing like, 
the Valentine's, the Mother's Day spread of, of uh, chocolate. Like, don't feed your mother chocolate. What do you want to do? Kill her and, and get, uh, get, her, um, get her inheritance early? You know, wake the fuck up. It's not, that's what his line is, wake the fuck up. It's not obvious. But it is incredibly hard to fix. Um, so how do you fix it? Most of that work uh, needs to be done, by, but not all, needs to be done by government. Because if you take, for example, the junk food cycle, if Nestle tomorrow pulled all of their sweets, what would happen? P&G would come in, other companies would come in. They would, you know, they would um, go out of business, but someone else would fill the gap. The money would still go there. And so you need to break that feedback loop. And on the junk food cycle, you do that one of two ways. You either change the economics, you make it less profitable, less attractive to sell that thing, restrictions on advertising, taxes, or, as I think might happen, there's actually two parts of that feedback loop, and one is your appetite, and Wagovia's MPIC is just one of what will be a huge range of appetite-suppressing drugs. There's even one that is not injection, that's pills, that is currently... Uh, going through trials, and I think there is a chance that we don't get on top of the regulation of food companies, and actually we just see a movement of profit from the food companies to the drug companies. I mean, it, it, it will have to some degree the same effect. It's much more expensive, uh, and I think there are all sorts of problems which I don't have time to talk about down the line, but I think that's where we are on junk food. On environment, I think actually we are in a much better place. In this country particularly, we are world leading. We now have introduced, having come out of Europe, it's about the one thing that George Monbiot and uh, whoever's a big Brexiteer can agree on is that the one thing that coming out of Europe has done has enabled us to change the way we subsidize farming. We are now paying public money for public goods. We're not paying people to destroy things. We're raising the regulatory baseline. And if we don't do trade deals that enable foreign farmers to compete with our farmers doing stuff that, you're, that isn't legal to do here, that actually we could be the first country to show how on the environmental side you can create a food system that produces enough calories, um, uh, restores biodiversity and sequesters carbon. So those are things that, you know, huge, the power of the state, the monopoly on violence is required to fix those feedback loops. So to come back to hospitality, what are our responsibilities? Well, I think that the first thing is, and I would, I would recognise the 2050 thing, it's not responsibility, it's an inevitability. I think if you look at the way regulation is evolving, I think it is going to be, it literally will be unsustainable not to be sustainable by 2030 and then 2050. I don't think there is any chance of pulling back on that and so what you will see is you will see company, some companies ignoring it and making money now and then going out of business and some companies getting ahead of it and obviously I would advise you to get ahead of it if you are a small company if you don't have these huge resources internally that big companies do call the Sustainable Restaurant Association but just begin to think about getting ahead of the environmental uh, areas the, the second thing that I think you can do is, uh, is on meat. I noticed that there was no meat here today, and meat is much misunderstood. So uh, everyone, or most of the narrative about meat is that it's about, uh, about carbon, about methane, and actually that's important, but it's not why we need to reduce the amount of meat we eat. That's about land. So land is the scarcest resource that we have, for most of human existence, we used land and the action of sunlight on land to produce almost everything we had, clothes, energy, food, shelter. And then, uh, 100 or so years ago, uh, 200 years ago, we found a whole bunch, millions of years of sunlight trapped in the forms of fossil fuels. And during the Industrial Revolution and beyond, we have stopped using the land. We have used that trap sunlight to produce almost everything except for food, and in some cases, actually, food. So, for example, uh, the acetic acid in quite a lot of salt and vinegar crisps is a byproduct of fracking petrol. Um, so, but, but we're now in a situation where 
we can't do that anymore. We can't, so we have to go back to that land and think, okay, so we now need that land to produce energy. We need it to produce food. We need it to produce materials. If we are no longer able to use uh, the fossil fuels, how do we do that? And that puts pressure on the land. And the reason that meat is important is because at the moment, 75% of the land that we farm globally is used either to rear crops to feed to animals or to graze animals. And it's just an incredibly inefficient use of land. And we looked at this country. If you reduce the amount of meat we ate by 30%, uh, you could have a huge impact. You could, you could solve all the problems almost immediately. And that is where I think we, actually, the most important thing that you can do in hospitality is to... It's very... Politicians don't want to touch it, rightly so. People don't want the government to tell them to eat less meat. But I think we can show people how that is that vegetables can be delicious. Literally, it's as simple as that. We can change the... The, the kind of the way in which people perceive the food system of being meat and veg. So I'm got I'm on a long term uh, campaign to get Will Beckett at Hawksmoor to to make uh, to make roast cauliflower the central element of the Hawksmoor menu with beef on the side. Obviously, some of you are going to be more challenged in this than others, but I do think there is that opportunity, and I would think both with your staff and with your customers, I really think if we can make meat eating not seem essential to pleasure, then we will have done. A lot. Just finally, on health, I think f for most of us, the health thing isn't going to be a big issue. I think that the calories on menus was stupid. There's uh, evidence to show it doesn't really work, and it was an example of government wanting to do something rather than do the thing that works. But for those of us who feed people, about 25% of calories are now eaten out of home, and for those of us who feed people a lot, that, that regulation is going to hit you. So if you're a Burger King or a McDonald's or a Greggs, I think, and I was speaking to the former CEO of Greggs the other day, I think you are going to be, begin to be placed in the same camp as the processed food companies. So you just need to be prepared for that and how that's going to hit you down the line. Um, so I just wanted to finish by saying thank you very much. It's been, I think, Peter, what Peter does here is absolutely incredible. And I think that London and the UK at the moment, I was sent when I was a, a young journalist years ago to go and look at food, restaurants in France versus restaurants in England. And they were all, it was when we had the kind of eagle had just started and Quaglinos and we were suddenly thinking, oh, we know how to do food. And like outside about five restaurants in London, it was all shit and France was amazing. <laughs> and, uh, and I did that again with my mother the other day and France is now shit and England... <laughs> is amazing, and that is due to this incredible energy and talent of all of you guys in this sector. So thank you very much for being so much pleasure to so many people. Thank you.